All right, so I'll explain that and then I'm gonna introduce all these guys. Um, very long story short, we are kind of like a special projects team and we launch companies for our own account and also with strategic partners. So everything you saw there, um, we had a hand in concepting or launching and everything that you saw there we did hand in hand with veterans. Um, so the bar, for example, was an outdoor survival training bar in Miami. So it was kind of this, this crazy wacky place but we had veterans running the bar and you could learn about how to use a tourniquet, how to use a med kit. Uh, the climbing gyms are these 45 and 60,000 square foot facilities that we were launching all over the country. And now our, currently our COO is a former uh, Submariner officer. We've got a bunch of veterans hired and running these types of businesses. Um, so it's a really kind of fascinating way to cross pollinate facets from the military veteran community in the business uh, sector. So here um, on our panel, Griff uh, has been kind of working with us uh, since day one. Um, incredible history in the military, an incredible entrepreneur as a company called Combat Flip Flops. Uh, just an amazing human being. I'll let him tell uh, his story. Trey is recently out. Um, I think I can say Special Forces. Yeah. Um, is stepping into the private sector at a very interesting level. Uh, Michelle is actually this guy's better half um, and has an awesome history with Arcteryx. Is also prior military service. Um, so we're kind of going to talk through um, these guys' transition into the private sector, what's going on and why the private sector hasn't really identified uh, in an effective way, how to really integrate special operations into what they're doing. Um, and Trey, you can kind of talk about your the whole transition. Yeah, so. say I just I just got done with it. So uh, yeah, um, but first I introduce myself, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I I've, I've been a civilian for a few days now. That's how fresh I am. Um, I got a haircut, and they're like, "What do you want to do?" And I was like, "Let's take it off the ears, I guess." But uh, it's a pretty nice feeling. Um, but uh, I joined the military really when right out of high school, 17 years old, went to basic training at the academy, and I'm a West Point grad, class of 2005, go Army, beat Navy. Um, and uh, after that, I, I was commissioned as an officer in field artillery. And so um, I went on a deployment as an artillery officer, uh, and I had the pleasure of uh, serving with directly with special operations forces and supporting them. So right then I pretty much knew what I wanted to do um, as soon as I got back in country. And so when I came back, I applied and was accepted for assessment and selection. After a long, arduous selection, I, I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of the, uh, one of seven officers in the class that, that made it uh, to the end and was selected. Uh, and then from there I went through the Special Force Qualification course, and two years later, um, I was able to put the Green Beret on, and I've done that since uh, 2000 and 2012, uh, with, with a few different deployments under my belt as well, and uh, I found myself at the end of it kind of uh, asking myself, what's next? And um, so I, I dropped my packet to get out, and I knew that I wanted to get into tech, and so uh, just because of my personal passions uh, and, and what I would do kind of on my off time. I knew that, uh, I knew that the mindset that, that really inspired me and was cultivated in special operations, I knew that there were parallels in, in tech. And so um, I was fortunate to, to successfully transition by being offered a job in tech. And here I am in New York talking to you guys. So. So it's a pleasure. Thanks for coming, guys. So Griff, um, and these guys, I mean, things he didn't tell you is like he and his brothers taught themselves how to code in a month, and they came in second at a competition at MIT. Um, he's developed. He came in, in the final. Final, sorry. The, the final. Uh, he, he developed an app where, because he needed it, where he, you can point your phone at a map, and it turns into a 3D rendering. So the, the point here is these are individuals who not necessarily on paper have the qualifications to step right into tech jobs but are some of the most intellectually informed, capable, dynamic folks you'll ever meet. Um, you know, Griff, Michelle, definitely check those boxes. Combat flip-flops. Um, it's really interesting about a lot of these guys that we have the honor of working with is they get out and they're very disenfranchised with their foreign policy and they start these incredible organizations that are entrepreneurial but looking at uh, conducting foreign policy in a different way. So Combat Flip-Flops is going in and employing Afghans and Iraqis uh, to make flip-flops with the slogan, these are these beautiful things here. Uh, bad for running, worse for fighting, I get that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and putting uh, Afghani women in school. I was going to talk more about that, but uh, yeah, this guy's been, been there for us for, for a long time. So what, what's your story? 
Uh, so just like Trey here, I was, went and joined the military right out of high school. I'm a 2001 academy graduate. Uh, I was in the artillery, just like Trey as well. Um, during my academy career, I got exposed to the Ranger Regiment, so guys who like to jump out of the back of helicopters and shoot lots of machine guns and drive really badass trucks, and I said, I want to go work with those guys, and I want to go you know, have the biggest guns while we did it, so I was an artillery officer, and then I served uh, in a conventional unit for nine months, and then I got the 2nd Ranger Battalion in July of 2003, and then immediately deployed to Afghanistan, and then Afghanistan, and then Afghanistan, and then Iraq. Uh, so it was four right in a row. Uh, meanwhile, uh, my wife and I had... How's that for the marriage? Yeah. Strong. Yeah, we, we got married and I deployed three days later. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, and I got out in 2006 because it was either go to the Special Forces Qualification Course or transfer to infantry or stay in the artillery and all of those courses of action involved me being away from my family, uh, who I really didn't know at that point. So I transitioned out to the military. Uh, I took the first job that was offered to me, like most guys in the military do. I built homes, and then when the market crashed in 2008, I changed gears and I went to work for a, a medical company, um, selling remote medical clinics and equipment all over the world. And so I spent a few years bouncing between Asia, Middle East, Africa, putting in clinics in the middle of nowhere and figuring out all the processes and procedures to do that. And everywhere I went, I saw entrepreneurs are making the significant difference in these developing nations. They were really causing the, the prosperity and the security. And I thought to myself, why aren't we doing more of this as a nation as our foreign policy? Long story short, ended up in a combat boot factory in Kabul, Afghanistan. Saw a flip-flop thong punch through a combat boot sole. Thought it was ugly and cool and started a company called Combat Flip Flops. So, yeah. that was um, it. <laughs> and so I've been, I've been hearing about stories for you for years, and I'm uh, honored to finally have you up here. Um, amazing history, also prior service. Um, ran a uh, program for Arcteryx, which I'm sure you guys all know. It was on the leaf side of the house, if I have that correct. Um, so I'd love to hear your, your perspective. You're kind of on the, you're on the hiring side of the special operations community. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have a special operations background myself, other than you know being part of a soft team, <laughs> the Ranger's wife. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, it was Army, and yeah, decided to pursue the Army because it was, uh, when I went out to the Academy, it was just people, leadership, motivation, and that really appealed to me. And uh, when we got out of the military, ended up going into the outdoor industry. Um, was fortunate enough to find something that, that used my business interests and, and military background to help the military and work in the government sector. So I started with a Seattle company, Outdoor Research, for a few years, and then ended up at, at Arcteryx in 2009, part of their LEAF program, which is law enforcement and armed forces. So Arcteryx is a well-known outdoor brand that started as a climbing company and expanded into apparel and hard goods, and so it was a real privilege to work. I was the commercial director for six years uh, up in Vancouver, building the team to support SOF from the US, Canada, Europe, uh, you name it, working with coalition organizations on both military and police side to build better equipment for them. And then also have the privilege of, of hiring some of those folks into our team and watching them impact not only, the, not only the military commercial business, but the outdoor commercial business through developing relationship, having opportunities to lead and, um, and educate and communicate and, and teach. So it was really, really fun to watch these guys integrate into an industry that's, you know, uh, seems like it would be very, very opposite from the military side of things, and see them successfully come in and actually inspire the outdoor side of the business to, to do great things as well is pretty, pretty cool. cool. So, um, so from from our world, guys, like um, the whole point is we get a lot of interest from companies who now think, well, veterans are assets, and we, we get that. We want to hire veterans. You know, Home Depot and Starbucks and all these companies, you know, with making these massive commitments, yet they're, they're bringing them in as greeters. You know, they're well-intentioned, there are truck drivers or, you know, first responders, um, which is, which is well-intentioned, but I think that's kind of a 1.0 of addressing uh, a really large issue in this country. And, you know, I think veterans in general are some of the greatest assets this country has. Special operations in particular, at least from an entrepreneurial perspective, have a lot of incredible skills that are, you know, readily, readily implementable if you know how to do it. Um, so, you know, Diageo, Uber, um, you know, IDEO, all these design firms, you know, some companies are more ahead of others. BAM are bringing in a lot of, a lot of uh, 
a lot of veterans. But I'm gonna ask you guys, so, you know, we get in companies that we start, we kind of understand and understand how to attract, especially soft, and kind of create a culture that attracts and activates a certain type of, of personality, which is, you know, high integrity, um, you know, there's gotta be camaraderie, there's gotta be purpose. Um, and the structure is just kind of fundamentally different. How would, you know, you approach these companies, whether it's a BAM or other companies that you've interfaced with through Combat Flip Flops or Arcterex, how do you bring facets from your world uh, into, into their ranks? Who wants it? Mm -hmm. I know, you're looking at me. <laughs> uh, I think when you, when you aggressively step up and address a problem, like businesses have problems. We're in the, any product that's worth anything solves a problem. Right, that's just it. That's how it's how you add value in a business is you solve problems. And coming out of the special operations community, that, co that community is a community of problem solvers. They they look for the root cause. They don't look at the symptom and try to take care of the sy symptom. They ask the why. Why is it this way? What's the systemic approach? What's what? What is going wrong? Is it a people person people problem, or is it a systems problem? And then how do we get to the root of that problem? And how do we effectively address that problem in a meaningful way that helps the organization accomplish its goal? And the, the only way you do that is just to, to get in there and people are just people and they, hey, what's your problem? Clearly articulate it to me. And then they keep digging into the why and the why. And then you watch the special operations guys immediately get up, go to the whiteboard and start mapping it out and then developing a plan and it's aggressive problem solving. And I think that's it, the only way that I can describe it and how you transfer it into those organizations is just demonstrated action. You put those people in a room, tell me your problem, and then they immediately start actioning the problem-solving techniques or the decision-making process to solve the problem. Yeah, I, I, uh, I want to see how you answered that, so if I could, mm -hmm. if I could build mm -hmm. on it. But um, for me, I think it's important um, for, a comp for a company asking themselves, like, we want veterans, but uh, you know, what can they really do, right? Veterans are kind of this monolithic entity to companies, you know, like, Starbucks or Amazon, right? Um, and when it comes to soft, I think it's it's valuable um, that you guys are here um, because it's important to know that soft is what's considered a strategic asset by the DOD, the Department of Defense. Okay, and what that means is special operations forces are deployed only in the strategic interests or to carry out operations that have strategic ramifications. So very high level, um, high risk, high payoff um, type of operations. And those require a certain type of people, right? I, I had mentioned selection and assessment and the types of training that we go through. Um, you know, I'm not 6'2", 240 pounds, that, that image of, that you see when you play Call of Duty. Um, and You're far better looking. Right, right. I, I have that going for me. But the, my point is, is, you know, those people, yeah, of course they are. You have special operations guys that look like that, but you also have guys like me, and it's because they don't select for, for that. I mean, physical fitness is a part of it, but you have to, it's a cerebral job. Um, and because you have to have the maturity and the ability to, uh, to do that complex problem solving while understanding your place in the strategic picture. And, uh, and when it comes to an organization, that's an important quality to have. You know, you need leaders that aren't just your, um, you know, telling people where to go, telling people what to do, making sure that people are there on time. But you want leaders that can drive, you know, cross-functional teams towards those strategic goals and be able to kind of call audibles uh, as needed because they understand the big picture and their place in it. Um, so that's a, that's what you get with a soft veteran because that's the world that they live in, you know, highly autonomous. We deploy to these places that are highly remote and we're entrusted to carry out these missions without any guidance. You know, we're given guidance before we get on the plane and there's a good chance that you might not talk to your boss again until six months later, you know, uh, and you're, you're entrusted. Uh, and, and those are the people that they select uh, and, and, and develop and cultivate. The, the guys that they know can do that. I can, send, I can send, you know, Trey here and give him a mission and I know that he's gonna accomplish it without me having to tell him what to do. So 
Yeah. I, well, just to kind of go on to add to this, so my experience is um, they're excellent at executing a mission, but something that's really helpful, and I would say not just for SOF, but you know, for all employees, but particularly for SOF, is you can give them a mission and tell them what it is that they, you want them to accomplish, and they will start breaking it down excellent at planning, but if you really want to speed up the process, process and most efficiently use them as an asset, they need to understand their assets. So what do they have at their disposal? So not only what do you want them to do, but also what are their boundaries, what are their constraints, and what does their support network look like? Because these guys are used to operating at a very, very high value level. And just like a CEO of a business where their time is extremely valuable and you need to be most efficient and effective with the CEO's time, same thing with these guys and gals is making most effective use of their time by making sure that they understand the support network within your organization that they have at their disposal. Uh, because at the end of the day, they're gonna get the mission done. But when they first transition out, they may not necessarily know what's in their lane or what's not in their lane or what support they have. And the faster that they are really have a good grasp of what's at their disposal, the more, you're, the more juice you're gonna get out of the squeeze, if you will, so. And most, I think most soft veterans thrive in those types of environments because mm -hmm. that's, that's really what made them successful, mm -hmm. you know, in the first place. And, and definitely speaking personally, I mean, that's, that's what drove me to soft, right? I, I, I didn't really, I, my, my parents both served, you know, I, I was brought up, I, I wanted to serve, but I can honestly say I never really kind of found my place in the army. I always felt like I didn't fit in because I had a better way of doing something or, um, or I would, figure out solutions to problems that weren't in my lane, you know, and the army, the conventional military is a bit more, uh, it's a bit more regimented, you know, like you have, you have a job, you have a lane. And, uh, but, you know, I'll never forget it. It's a, it's a funny, it's not really a funny story. So you guys, if it's not, don't, don't worry about laughing. But I knew, I knew the moment that I kind of belonged in SF was in the Q course. Uh, and we were, it's a detachment commander's portion of it, and we were doing a, a, a meet with a guerrilla chief, so like a role player. And, uh, you know, we're in civilian clothes, and we had been smuggled into this, into a town in the back of a truck and walked all night, and we were going to meet this guy who represented uh, the resistance in the area. And he was supposed to be a real jerk, you know, and, and he played the part. Um, and we're all sitting much like this in a, in a, I think it was like a, a garage, like a auto repair place in the back of it. And we'd come in and we hadn't gotten searched by his guys and, and we're sitting down. And of course our role is, Hey, we're, we're a special operations team. We've just infilled. We're here to help you build your resistance and, uh, you know, accomplish your objectives. And, and he went into this just putting us down. You guys can't do anything for me. I don't trust you. He said, I want to talk to the government in, in, in the other country. Uh, and he wouldn't do anything, you, roadblocks and everything. He said, I want to talk to the president in exile that I served with. And I'm not going to do, I'm not going to give you guys any equipment. I'm not going to give you guys a place to sleep. You're not going to do anything until, until I talk to him. And everybody was kind of like, what do we do, you know? And at the beginning of the operation, they give you all this equipment, right? And it's, most people go, well, it's just to make your ruck heavy, right? Um, and in there, there's a, there's a sat phone. Nobody, they give it to us. You're not going to use that sat phone. You know, it's like I said, it's a brick. It's to make your ruck heavy. And you forget about it. You pack up your, your stuff, and at the end of it, it's a sensitive item that you have to turn in, you know, and keep accountability of. And everybody was kind of like, didn't know what to do. And I was, when you took our bags, I've got a sat phone in my ruck right now. We can call the president right now, and we can get on with business, you know. And, um, they had to stop the exercise because that wasn't in the script, 
like you weren't supposed to remember that you had a phone that because they didn't remember you know and so um, that's that's kind of when I knew that I had like I got it you know I belong there because we call them like Jedi mind tricks you know like I, I got the Jedi mind trick um, and so it's that kind of outside the box thinking problem solving that that really turned me on to it and uh, and I was able to thrive and so um, yeah, that, that, that has tons. Obviously, like, there's, there's lots of use cases in the private sector. One of the guys that Trey actually served with was had come through a program a while ago, and I used to bring him. Um, we, we bring veterans that like, we work with to, to events to present or to run classes, and that's how they kind of interface with the private sector. And I had brought him to uh, Babson College, which is an entrepreneurial school, to present. And we had also met with a couple of people who were the administration of the school. And we had a meeting one-on-one, -on -one and, and this guy was sitting there with me, and, and we, I left the office, and I said, so hey, what do you think about this? And he did an entire psychological profile of this, of this woman that we were meeting with. Oh, well, she's right-handed, she has three kids, she's a triathlete, she's obviously well-read in the classics, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, interesting. You, you know, a civilian, an entrepreneur wouldn't necessarily kind of do that kind of thing. I walked back in and I said, hey, why don't you recite what you've just told me, you know, to this woman's face? And, and he had nailed, you know, verbatim, to this woman's entire background, had her, her entire personality pegged. Um, and there, there's huge corollaries and like a, you know, advantages you can, you can utilize with that kind of information in business, right? In negotiations, these are the kind of guys that can walk into a room and can look at you, know, you and tell you what you do for a living or tell you, you know, what your strong side is or what kind of personality you have. And that serves you well in negotiations. Um, my, my question for you guys around that is c conventional companies that say, hey, we want to hire veterans, well, I say that's great. Um, you can't have a special operations guy submit a resume through a traditional HR department because that's not going to go anywhere. You know, the, the skills don't necessarily translate. Um, how would you suggest all these companies saying that they want to work with special operations? Hypothetically, they get that you guys are more dynamic assets. Um, but I don't, I don't, from what I've seen, it isn't necessarily a plug and play like you said earlier. You know, there needs to be cross training, not only for the veterans to learn how their skills are relevant in the private sector, but more importantly, I would argue, for the companies uh, to figure out who the heck these guys are what skills they bring to the table, and what kind of environment they need to set up to have them be successful. Um, so th that's a massive challenge these days. Um, and your guys' line of work, like, how would you address that? Well, it's, as somebody that just kind of went through that, having to explain to companies, well, great resume, but like, what is, what is it? Why, do you, why are you sitting here? Um, there's obviously, as, as a guy that's coming out of the army or the military, any kind of service, there is a responsibility on his part to be able to sell himself to a company. You know, the, it's not the company's job to understand. But at the same time, you know, that's why you guys are sitting here is so that you can learn about who we are and how you can help facilitate that. And I wouldn't be sitting here without awesome mentorship from people in the industry that were willing to talk to me. So I would encourage companies that are interested in hiring soft veterans. There are all sorts of great groups out there. You can find them through LinkedIn um, or just uh, other social media or, or, um, or veteran events. You know, if, if your company's interested in hiring veterans from soft, like offer mentorship, you know, get to know them um, and you'll get a better idea who they are as people. So that's, that's one thing that, that I think companies can do that, that really um, that'll help them learn more about our background specifically. Yeah, and I think if you're, if you're looking for a certain geographical area, there's probably a, a crew of veterans around. And if there's any crew of veterans that are networked, it's the special operations group that's networking. You know, I'm in Seattle and we have what we call our Seattle Soft Mafia. And when anybody's looking for a certain job or a skill set, they'll tag somebody in the group it'll immediately go out and then we'll source within our network to find somebody to fill that position or find three or four guys. So it helps the, uh, our network wants our veterans and our community to be placed in jobs that are a good fit. And then we also want the community to understand that we're an asset and we want to contribute positively to lo our local area. Um, so what we do is we try to, we try to place the guys there. Uh, we vet them in so you understand you're getting a real special operations guy uh, in the job who's done well in the community. Uh, and then you know, we'll say, hey, this is the type of person that you're getting. This is what they're capable of. You know, be very direct with them. Tell them what you want. And they're typically going to deliver. And so I think it really just comes down to candor 
uh, candor and authenticity when you're speaking with these guys mm -hmm. coming into the position and getting them to understand where they, what they need to do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there, um, there's so many networking events out there and the community is small and, and so close that uh, it's not hard to meet guys from our community and we'll introduce you to other people. And, and so uh, it's a great resource for hiring managers. You know, if you don't know what you're looking for, um, except for kind of a description, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's out there for sure. Um, so, and, and, yeah. and in the private sector, I think the most important thing in start, at least starting companies uh, is, is people, obviously, right? It's, it's without your good team, you're, you're nothing. Um, and from our experience, there is a level of, of capability and capacity amongst this, this particular demographic, which is um, ridiculously diverse. Uncommonly so, um, you know whether it's you know the ability to advocate for themselves, uh, art articulate or learn. I mean these guys are professional learners. And correct me where I'm wrong, but I think like, an average special forces soldier who's been in for 15 years, like the amount spent on their education is upwards of 15 million dollars. So it's, it's an astronomical amount of money that's spent, and these guys are constantly learning. And the interesting thing that's different from the civilian world is they don't ever really become experts, right? They're always learning to be better for the team. Um, which kind of prevents an ego from being formed. Um, so, you know, I've seen special operations veterans get out and within three or four years launch some of the largest international charity organizations in the country, right? Because they were able to teach themselves the system, accounting, you know, everything um, far faster than the normal folks. Um, so that's, that's a skill, at least that we've seen. Um, and we've tried to hire, hire specifically from this community for a reason. Um, how do we? How do we demonstrate that more? So we're sitting in a room, people are in the in the streaming media industry, right? Why why is this relevant at all to to the like four or five of you who aren't veterans in this room? How many are there that are actually aren't veterans? Like one or two? Oh, there you go. Oh man. Uh, so, so why are these guys? Well, why would it be beneficial for them to to really engage with special operations? Is that me? I'm sorry. I, you know, to go off your point, I really think uh, our community is about mastery and knowing that we'll never reach that level. It's, it's constant, continual learning, no matter what it is. And I use the example of, uh, they have this, you know, AC-130 gunship is this huge, slow-moving bird with a big cannon that hangs out of the side of it. It's got a bunch of sensors in it. It's, it's a really cool, devastating asset that can really pinpoint individual people, and they have the ability to tell between militants and guys wearing body armor and all the things through all their sensors. And uh, there was this new piece of equipment that came out. It was streaming media. So I could stream on the ground because my job was to control the bird in the sky that I could see what was going on in the bird so I could check out what was going on in the ground and make sure that we weren't, if we were working super close to our own guys, we weren't going to hit any of our own. And uh, they said, well, uh, here's the box. Uh, here's the manual. Uh, you have to demonstrate this to a head of another foreign government in 24 hours. And we're in Afghanistan. Like, all right, I guess we get up, like, hey, get the guys, like, get the Jeep, we're going to roll down to the airfield, get the air crew, like, plug this thing in, read the manual, like, everybody's sitting there plugging stuff into the bird, and then, you know, 12 hours later, we got the thing working, all right, go fly the bird, all right, so you got, you know, young 25-year-old captain telling a colonel to get the bird up in the air, and then, hey, that's, that's what's going to happen, and then we fumbled through it the next day, but within two months, we were masters of this technology, communicating back to the manufacturer, you need to make these four changes to make it better for our team. And it was just rapid development and access. And by the time that I had gotten back and gone to a training course where they were kind of releasing this technology to the rest of the military, you know, we had already known everything about it and we were able to communicate to our peers in the Air Force and the Marines and the Navy about how the technology works and how to better implement it in their systems. And so you put a special operations guy in with a new technology they're going to master it. Like they have, they, there's everything in their being says that they are going to master it, and you cannot stop them from doing it. And then make the changes to technology, and then send them out to the rest of your community to have them spread that wealth of knowledge. Like that's what special operations does for the military: is we develop the best practices for the rest of the, the machine to use. Yeah, can you guys understand how that might apply to business? Yes. Makes sense. Yeah. No, I'm asking. Seriously, mm -hmm. I, mean, I can elaborate. Yeah. Can you add to that? It's really important too that you understand that. You know, these guys and gals come from all different experiences, all different jobs within the units, all different ranks, all different levels of responsibility. So I think it's the responsibility of the business or the organization looking to hire these folks to really get to know them, just like any other person you would hire. 
What's their background? You know, how do they lead? What helps them as far as communication, regularity, type of communication, frequency, follow-up, all of those kinds of things so that, that they can be used. It's not one big lump, right? We're not, we're not just drawing out of a bucket where everybody's the same. All of these guys have ex vast training and different kinds of training. And, uh, and it's, it's the business's responsibility to really know what's going on so that they can use them well, because um, there's nothing worse than bringing one of these extremely talented people into your organization and mishandling them, right. because you don't know what you've got or how to use it, or how to work with them, so uh, conversations. Yeah, that's a hugely valuable point, and if we, we hit on that earlier, um, there's all these transition institutes for veterans where guys get out, you know, hey, learn how to advocate for yourself, learn how to write a resume, learn, here's how you set up a LinkedIn profile. Those, those things are all like profoundly important, um, but no one, I, you know, no one teaches you how to hustle, A, and B, no one's doing that for the businesses. So it's kind of a one-sided issue. Right? I think it's the biggest problem we have in the private sector and why we do things like this um, is the companies really need to understand that it's a discipline that needs to be mastered to figure out truly how to attract this type of demographic and how to adapt their culture and their hiring process and their team structures to really learn to activate this type of asset. Uh, I mean, you know, the video we saw the rock climbing gyms, like that, you know, that's a, a, a venture backed business now. We have two veterans who were, you know, one was a medic, or both were medics, like they're basically running uh, a $100 million company, right? And they didn't have any experience whatsoever in the climbing gym industry. But because you set up a certain culture that allows them to do what they do, which is to adapt and learn rapidly with a lot of autonomy, they do amazing things. And like Michelle just said, um, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter what the technical background is per se. Um, incredibly adaptable, right? This would be a funny, funny thing, thing but imagine that um, you, you, uh, Superman, right? Batman. Captain America, if you actually look at it through the lens of you just hired Captain America to your team and you're going to go in and he's now part of your organization, how would you approach Captain America? Would you sit down and be like, hey, you know, here's, here's, here's the lunchroom here's and the here's the, you know, I need these reports on Friday and, uh, and let him fend for himself or would you sit down and get to know like, okay, you're an amazing, you're an amazing part of our, our team and we're going to do great things because now you, we've brought you into the room, so I need to know what you need from me to help us kill it and really like leverage that well. I think of it through that mindset because that's genuinely what you're getting. Granted, all shapes and sizes and, and, uh, and skill sets and whatnot, but you're getting a dynamite package of skill sets and motivation and uh, say, so, yeah. I think ultimately, if you're, if you're hiring to grow your organization, you look for skills that will, that will kind of, that'll help grow it, not just at the time, but set up the organization for growth in the future, like internal development, uh, knowledge management and retention, how you take institutional knowledge and, uh, and, and codify it and maintain it. Um, and in the military, that's, that's, that's a normal part of life. I mean, that's, that's baked into it, right? I mean, SOP development, um, battle drills, things like that, and uh, leadership development, you know, how we, how we bring guys up and, and uh, develop our leaders from within. And all of that is very valuable for any growing company um, or any company that wants to find, them, find themselves uh, started small, you know, and now they're becoming wildly successful and dealing with that transition. Um, so you also, like you said, you know, you get all of these skills, but it's, it's, not, just, um, it's not just the problem solving or the, or the critical thinking skills if there's anything that the military really kind of gets right is organization of systems and structures and and how you uh, how you maintain that knowledge base and grow it uh, and improve it in a very structured way an organized way so I think what you want to add to that uh, it's, it's uh, I think the way I don't, I don't want to sound odd to this, but like the, it sounds very structured as what he just said and very organized, but it's 
it's rapidly developing. Right? And so it's not a matter of, hey, we're going to put this in this logbook and we're always going to do it this way. It's, OK, we just faced this kind of explosive last night. All right, let's identify it. How, what did we learn from it? What types of explosives are going into this building? How do we mitigate this risk? And that goes into a very documented system. It gets distributed out to everybody. So that way, the next day, those practices are being immediately implemented. And we get feedback from other sections of the field. And then that information comes back up through the system and then gets distributed back down to everybody again in a very meaningful, actionable way. Mm -hmm. And you know, they've been doing it with literally their lives on the line for the past 16 years. And so it's, it's a part of their daily life. We have a problem. Solve the problem. Communicate it to everybody. Is anybody else having that problem? How did you solve it? OK, this is the best way to do it. Distribute it to the organization. And it just it happens. It just it's natural within the course of doing business. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of end. Uh, I know you guys want to start drinking, um, but you know it has been like a tremendous honor personally and as a civilian, like, tremendously refreshing to have found a, a group of individuals that actually have like, integrity to the fault. I mean, there's it's just there isn't another group of people out there that I, I've encountered at least personally that you can implicitly trust, and that when they shake your hand, they're going to deliver, right? And there's a, there's a sense of not to sound cheesy, uh, there's a sense of honor and there's a sense of purpose that they bring to whatever it is that they decide to really devote themselves to. Um, and that's a very rare thing, I think, in society these days, and a thing I think a lot of companies are looking for. Um, they're, they're trying to figure out how to be more authentic, right? In a, in a true authentic way. They, they really want to do better. They want to have more of an impact. They want to figure out how to adapt their culture uh, to, to attract the millennials or, or, or whatever. Um, and there is not a, a group of individuals, uh, I think, more capable uh, that have the personality that you know I know I could I can meet once and if I needed something I could truly call on them you know and feel like they they show up right um, and that and that it's this community where it goes both ways there's a kind of an unspoken um, discipline around around friendship and communication which is carried into business if you do it the right way um, mm -hmm. so thank you guys um, for for coming and this is kind of this is kind of an experiment um, and uh, any questions you guys have before you start boozing yes mom. You guys need to get into government, too. Get into government. That's the level of integrity that you're dealing with. Well, it's coming. Like, there's, I'll have to say, it is coming. There's plenty of our communities coming back. We left mm -hmm. 16 years ago, and the country was in one state, and we're coming back and finding it in another state. And, you know, the, the network is activating. So I think you're going to see a lot of that leadership coming back in the, in the system in the next couple of years. Yeah. I think that was my question. You know, knowing that our president is very pro, has an affinity, if you will, for the military, are you working with The, By the way, thank you for your service before I say don't forget to say that, but are you working with the administration in that way? Are there any plans to start maybe looking at that? The, yeah, you first. There's a group that's been around for a while, started by a woman named Rachel Kleinfeld, called the Truman National Security Project. And it was basically taking veterans coming back who were incredibly disenfranchised by foreign policy and saying, okay, we're going to train you to be high powered aides and we're going to plant you in government. And this started about seven or eight years ago. So now these guys who have been overseas, have been deployed, have seen it firsthand, are now taking seriously powerful positions within government, you know, from, from Congress, governors, into the Senate already. Uh, and it's almost like a counterinsurgency in how things are being done. Um, and with the traditional administration, you might have more insight. Yeah, I mean, I think from a, our business standpoint is we're trying to be the leaders in that space. You know, we're doing something that everybody said was impossible, right? It's like taking special operations veterans coming out, going to war zones, trading an indigenous group of people to make a cool product that you would want bringing it to the US market, driving that demand through fun, engaging marketing, and then using the profits to put kids back in school, which will then eventually kill out radicalism. And we're doing it profitably and in the media, and it's fun. And so that's, I mean, it, the only way that you know, most people will do something is like, oh, you can't do it. Well, yeah, we can. We just did. Now it's possible. So you should do more of this. And so there, you're starting to see Kim Young. She runs Rumi Spice. Uh, so saffron threads out of um, southern Afghanistan, where she's taking the other Middle Eastern brokers out of the market who are taking the, 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 really the profits away from the farmers, and she's going direct to the farmers, employing thousands of people in communities, Air Force veterans flying scarves. They're around Bagram. They're employing women to make scarves. You know, we're, we're putting women to work in Kabul, we're employing Kashmir farmers in Herat. And so it, it is coming, but it's just slow because people historically didn't think it was possible in the way that you know, the military and 
um, foreign policy, especially State Department, has worked is like, well, this is the way it's always worked. So that's the way. We're, that's what we're going to do. This is this is our policy. This is how we operate. Well, the way we've been working isn't working, and so it's going to be new, innovative people out of special operations and those communities that are changing it. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Uh, building. Uh is startups and, and software companies in, in the US, it's expensive. You have to have engineers in Silicon Valley that salaries is huge. So what is the salary, and of course, as a range for people that have been in the SLA? That's a great question, and actually it's something that's, that's come up. And I think uh, it's important. There's one thing that I, I have. Oh, there you go. I've been doing it hey, all hey. this whole time. Um, like. It's important that that industry look at the value that that they're getting comparatively to their market space. It's not exploitation of veterans to get a, a deal because they need a job when they get out and transition. And I've heard it actually really pisses me off. I've heard companies that specifically recruit, you know, former military because they think. They don't have to pay them the industry rate when they're getting out because they're in a vulnerable time in their life. It takes veterans sometimes a little while because we don't have to advocate for our own salaries when we're in the military. It's assigned to us. Uh, and yet we bring our all, we bring our A-game, we get the mission done. And so when we carry that mentality into various industries, I think that there's a time of vulnerability when veterans are first getting out. And so I think that as a business, it's important that you evaluate them as an individual with the skills that they bring and the attitude that they have and the cultural fit that they are for your organization. And it should be competitive with whatever the market rate is. Uh, geographically, obviously, I mean, there's lots of different factors, but it should be, it should be competitive for whatever they're gonna add to your organization, I would say. Yeah, pay them what they're, pay them commensurate to their peers. That's what I just said, pay them fairly. Right. And you're going to find very quickly that you got a very good deal. Yes. And there's also all kinds of creative programs you can look at uh, with getting reimbursements from the government for, for employing veterans. It's, it's not a straightforward process, but it's very interesting from a tax credit perspective. And there's all kinds of dollars out there to offset uh, salaries that are take some creativity, but it's a very interesting play, mm -hmm. which is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, definitely win. So thank you all for your service. Um, I have a two-part question. So the first part is, has anybody actually done data analysis of where soft veterans currently are? Like five years out, where they're getting placed? It, it, like maybe there's, maybe it's actually not as bad as you think. I'm just curious. Um, I mean, as far as data analysis, that I've personally done or I've personally seen any of that, um, I, ha I haven't. But anecdotally, anecdotally, of course, is. Um, just my own personal kind of network and keeping up with everybody. Uh, and, and we talk amongst ourselves. I think that there is a feeling that, um, and I, I kind of concur, is uh, we get lumped in with, you know, veterans, the monolithic capital V veterans. Um, and as a result, um, I know guys that are severely underutilized or um, they're not able to get into some of the jobs that they want simply because there's not really an understanding of how their skills apply, you know? Um, and, but I'm, I'm not aware of any data analysis that does it, that, that, that's been done. That not necessarily. Done. And I would say yeah. going off of what, what, uh, what he just said is, is at first. When yeah. the vets first get out, mm -hmm. they're going through an adjustment period. It is only a matter of time. I mean, when Matt got out, he went to a job fair. There are some industries that understand the value of veterans, and they heavily recruit from the veteran community, knowing they're going to burn them out in about a 24-hour period or 24-month period of time. So it's a very baseline salary. It's a very high-stress job. There's some industries that do that intentionally, knowing that they're probably going to burn those guys out. It's a stepping stone. Yeah. So it's only a matter of time. I would say within four to five years, through the network and through the community, and, and working th with businesses that really understand the value, we yeah. end up. Uh, yeah. Landing in the right spot. Yeah, what I've what I've seen anecdotally, like just from the networks that I'm in, it's either they either become lawyers, right, because they like to fight. Um, they get into finance because they get really good at numbers and just figure out how to make lots of money, mm -hmm. or they uh, go into entrepreneurship because they really enjoy oh, problem solving and and running teams. Yeah. Yeah. The other part to my question is like, so Stanford has an unbelievable career service department, right, mm -hmm. and like. Part of the reason that their successful grads do well is because they get placed in jobs through these 
you know, like finely tuned engines. Does that exist in so, special operations for, like, do they have career service departments? And if so, like, there's not everybody's going to be a full time foundation. Right. Like, they're not all yeah. going to go on to be founders of companies, right? I mean, if we look at like the odds in the industry, maybe 5% of them have what it takes, even if they're as qualified mm -hmm. as you are. That doesn't mean that they couldn't excel in other positions at your you know, mm -hmm. tech companies. Like, what, orga what exists? There, there are organizations like, uh, I mean, there's, some are networking organizations that are informal through groups on LinkedIn and everything like that, right? And that's, that's kind of, uh, you know who you know and who can link you in with other people. As far as like Navy SEALs, right? Uh, they've got the Honor Foundation is a great one. It's not for Navy SEALs. Anybody can do it, but it, you know it's based out of San Diego. So, and it's ran by SEALs, you know, and, and so that's kind of and that's heavy, heavily, heavily metrics based. They're starting to they're the first right. people that are really tracking year yeah. one, year five, um, and there's you know the kind of the next generation transition institutes are starting to do mm -hmm. that, like the next ridge line for. Yeah. for they're the leaders right. in the space, the Honor Foundation is. Yeah. But, uh, but those were kind of, I think, created in response to the fact that we found that there wasn't anything that, there, were, there weren't any networks that supported our community specifically. Um, then, you know, there are lots of veteran network uh, events and, and organizations that help place veterans, but they don't kind of cater to you know, the background that we come from and the skills that we have. Um, and so I think, y yeah, there are a few, but it's in response to something. It's in response to a lack of, of something to help place us and, and help us sell our skill set. These guys have gone through a pretty crazy yeah. near two decades of, of being pretty busy at work. And I think it is in response to folks transitioning out after a decade plus. Being very unsatisfied with what they find, you know, like. The, very, very high, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I mean, too, like. It's a great question. Go ahead, please. Um, I know the teams are about a couple hundred guys who exit per year, but I don't have any sense of from SF or from Rangers on an annual basis how many people are transitioning. There, there's a large drawdown in the next couple of years that's going to start and there's within the, the special operations forces community and i can't give you the exact number whether it's sf ranger seal specifically but there's thousands and thousands of guys getting out like the next the next five years and I'll, I'll get you the exact number um but i think it's something like 6500 or 7,000, you know guys across the force that are exiting in the next like four years i think it is mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll check on that for you so, thanks for coming guys hey, one more yeah. There's a Hire Heroes USA, is a is a is a great organization. Yeah. Um, but it, but as far as like you know, getting out, I think it's for what it's a lot of people just don't understand is you came out of literally three month train up, two weeks block leave, three month rapid deployment, come home for three months, you know, train up, get the new guys spun up, two weeks leave, six month deployment, six months home, and you were just. Boom, 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 and the, the unit just keeps pace, and then it's like, hey, I'm going to leave the military, and that that cycle does not stop, right? So they are transitioning out of the military while still feeling utterly committed to the unit, trying to take care of their family, turn in all of their gear and equipment, and next thing you know, you get UTS leave, and then you're just stuck there just trying to figure it all out, and then a lot of the times, yeah, you search out a higher heroes USA or hit in LinkedIn or, or scramble all around and. Um, usually getting right out within the first like six months, I'd have to say it's, uh, you're probably not going to get the best presentation of the skill set. I mean, that's the, why the, you're, that's why you're we're just here. Not, yeah, you're just yeah, not going to get the best presentation of the skill set just because of like, they're, they're just making a rapid transition in their life. There are, yeah. There was a service that helped yeah. someone transition from that to the, I mean, you mentioned there's some places that do it, but if you get more like mainstream companies with some backing, do it. Yeah. 
That would be awesome. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> I mean, that's why we're sitting here, you know, we're, we're trying to advocate for soft veterans simply because there are those of us that, um, that, that felt like we didn't, we, we didn't get the support that we wanted, you know, and so yeah, I, I hope that uh, more and more companies as they hire soft veterans and see the value added, um, they support initiatives to, to do exactly like you said. Thank you guys, we'll let you guys go. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Cool.